Hey y'all, Pat Kelly here with Mad River Outfitters. I'm the fly manager and guide for the shop. Today we're gonna to be tying a peacock bass fly called the Peacock Punisher. All right, the Punisher was a fly that was kind of conceived a couple of trips ago. Um, this has been one of our best producing flies for me personally on these trips. Um, does have a few steps of this articulated fly. We're gonna be utilizing the Flyman uh, fish sinks today. We're gonna to be using a couple different models. What we're starting out with is the 25 millimeter uh, fish spine shank from Flyman. I like to use this in the back section. It's just a little bit finer wire, it's a little bit lighter. So it allows the fly to swim and kind of kick around a little bit better. Uh, the thread we're gonna be using is a 100 denier gel spun thread. Um, if you've seen any of the other videos, you'll know that I like this thread kind of has my all-purpose tying thread. Uh, most of what I do is more streamers and larger stuff, whether it's bass, pike, musky, um, smallmouth flies, things of that nature. So this thread just kind of lends itself really well to that style of tying. So what we did here is I started the thread just behind the eye of the hook, and I brought the, uh, the thread all the way back just to give myself a good foundation of thread, uh, which I find helps uh, give the, the uh, materials just a little bit more traction when we're tying the fly. Uh, the first stage in this fly, what I like to do is use some of this UV polar chenille from Hairline Dubbin. This is the, uh, the UV pearl color. And the reason for this stage in the fly is um, we're gonna be tying in some saddles for the tail. So what I like to do is I like to just palmer a little of this kind of in the rear third of this shank. And uh, what that does is it kind of serves as a prop for my saddles so that they don't uh, stick together. It allows them to stay separate and kind of breathe and swim and move a lot better in the water. So uh, to tie this in, just go ahead and kind of hold it right up here towards the back of the fl or shank rather. Go ahead and kind of get that locked in. Kind of advance your thread up and out of the way. Um, at this point, before I start wrapping, what I like to do just to uh, increase the durability of the fly is I will lay down um, just a little bit of uh, super glue here on the shank and then that way um, when I palmer this polar chenille forward there it'll kind of help bind that material to the uh, to the shank there. Anybody that has peacock bass fished will know that they can take a toll on uh, on flies so any little thing you can do to increase the durability of the fly so that it lasts longer uh, I think is, is really really helpful if you end up running out of flies or if all your flies get destroyed when you're in the jungle there, there's really no uh, local fly shop that you can stop at and, and restock on. So it's important that uh, you tie your stuff to, to be very durable and to last. So I like to take this material and I'll wind it, like I said, about a third of the way up the hook shank here. Um, all the shanks kind of have a little doubled over loop section in the back of them. What I like to do is I'll extend my polar chenille just about two or three wraps uh, in front of where that loop comes around there just to kind of get you into the straight portion of the shank. Once you get there, go ahead and tie that material off and cut that off. Give yourself a nice clean tying spot here for the, uh, for the saddles. Uh, now when we're tying these in, what I like to do is I kind of like to tie them in the round. So what I'll do is I'll start by tying a, uh, a saddle um, kind of on my near side and then I'll tie it on the far side and then we're going to do one top and bottom. I find that tying the feathers kind of on all sides of the fly just gives a nice kind of uniform look to the tail. Um, I also like to have a handful of feathers in there. You know, if you just put one or two in there, if one happens to get ripped out or cut, you know, the whole functionality of the fly uh, is kind of compromised. So by putting a handful of them in there, uh, just kind of, again, just adds to the durability of, uh, of the fly pattern. So we'll start on this near side get a hold of that uh, stem there on the uh, on the feathers. One thing I didn't mention, I do like to strip away the uh, some of the fibers at the end of the feather just to give myself a nice clean tying point when I'm locking these in. So once you get that near side tied in, take your vise, kind of spin it around, go ahead and lay that other saddle up on there and just go ahead and repeat that same process, get that locked in. Now that we have our kind of left and, uh, and right side tied in, we'll go ahead and tie in 
the saddles on the top and bottom. One of the reasons why I started to uh, tie some peacock flies with multiple sections, I, I, when I first started going down there, I was kind of just using a single hook design. Um, I fish all sorts of different flies down there, but uh, I, I started doing a fly uh, similar to, uh, to one of my staple pike flies. Um, this fly having three sections, the nice thing about it is it has a lot of movement in the water. It's constantly shifting left and right and kind of catching different currents and, and really swimming. Uh, and, and has a lot of tail kick and, and, and side to side in the fly. One thing with peacocks that I find, um, you know, any characteristic or a certain characteristic to your fly that you're kind of looking for is anything that has a ton of movement. Uh, it seems like the more you can stimulate or if you can even overstimulate the peacocks, it seems like the more excited they get. So having, having three different sections in this fly allows it to kind of swim and dart back and forth in a way that, uh, that a single hook design really can't do. So. Um, the last couple years this has kind of really proven to be a, a really really productive fly and like I said all it is is just kind of a slight variation of one of my kind of go-to pike streamers uh, that we use around here a lot when we're guiding um, as far as colors go typically with peacocks you know the brighter the colors the better they're uh, when peacocks feed they're they use a lot eyesight is their predominant sense that they're going to use when they are uh, when they're feeding and, and seeking out forage so something that has a lot of contrast this fly that we're doing today is going to have an all yellow body with a bright red head on it so your your contrast there is, is really really uh has a high contrast level to the fly so it stands out and pops in the water i find that to be probably one of the most important characteristics to a good peacock fly is uh, and so it's something that can pop and stand out especially down there you have really tannic water so it's almost black or tea colored so it's so really bright colors you know using UV flash products um, anything you can do to kind of help your fly stand out tends to uh, tends to work really really well again like with most steps I like to reinforce everything with a little bit of uh, brushable super glue after I get through them the uh, the next stage of the fly we're going to tie in some bucktail. We're going to do this by hollow tying the bucktail. As far as the length of this first section here, I like to do, uh, we're using a 25 millimeter shank here in the back. So if you do about two, two and a half times the length of this shank, uh, that's what I found to kind of be the best for, uh, for this particular stage of the fly. Go ahead and cut a small chunk of bucktail. Go ahead. Just like in the hollow fly, we're going to kind of preen out all the shorter fibers. What I like to do too, just take a quick glance at your tips. Just make sure they're kind of relatively lined up. Again, kind of hold it up to the fly here just to kind of gauge your length. That looks pretty good. Go ahead and trim your butts. Make a nice square cut with the bucktail. Go ahead and start by just laying this right on top of the um, the shank here. And one thing I did mention is I do like to move up about a halfway between where your tying point from the feathers were and the uh, and the eye of the hook here. So we'll lay that bucktail right on top. Uh, once your thread wraps have trapped the bucktail there, you're going to take your thumb and your forefinger and just kind of pinch on the top and bottom and kind of side to side. And what that will do is that will evenly uh, distribute that bucktail 360 degrees around the uh, the shank there and from there you can just kind of wrap back just securing that material making sure it's good and tight there on this particular fly I'm not too concerned with trimming these butts here I, I generally leave those tied in or I leave them um, exposed like that what one thing that does do is it, uh, it kind of shields the, the thread wraps that are in our previous tie there just to give you a little bit added protection. Um, that's one thing with peacock flies that you'll find will, uh, with me anyways, you'll find that I'm, I'm always thinking about anything I can do, any little thing that I can do to make the fly more durable. Um, it's worth taking the, the extra time and attention to detail to, to make sure that that happens. So we'll take our push tool, which is just an empty pen casing Kind of push all these fibers backwards. Kind of get in there with your left hand, 
hold all that stuff back out of the way. You want to take your bobbin and kind of pull your thread forward and then begin making a thread dam in front of this bucktail here. As far as the angle of your bucktail when you're building this thread dam here, for this first hollow tie, I typically like to, uh, I want my bucktail to kind of lay back at about a 45 degree angle to the rest of the body. So it's a relatively flat angle. As we progress and work our way forward on the fly, uh, we'll kind of increase that angle slightly, you know, steeper moving forward. Just, again, just to build profile and, and taper to the fly so it has a nice bait fish shape to it. Once that bucktail is kind of sitting where you want it and where you like, you can go ahead and just kind of advance your thread forward. Again, we will we'll, uh, reinforce these wraps with some super glue here. At this point, if you want to tie in some flashaboo, you can. I always incorporate flash into pretty much all of my flies. I don't think you can use too much of it. I'm a big fan of flash. Um, this flash material here is the Mirage Flashaboo. Uh, this is the fluorescent yellow color. This is one of my kind of go-to flashes for any species. Really, it's, it's kind of like that uh, opal as kind of the base, and then, uh, and then there's several different colors that it comes in, but it, it really reflects a lot of light. The other cool thing about it, just because it's kind of almost translucent a little bit, and that, that opal background, whatever color you lay it up against, it kind of draws uh, and saturate some of that color. So when I lay this on top of this yellow bucktail here, it kind of pulls in some of that color, uh, which looks really, really cool. So what I like to do, once I cut my flashaboo off, I'll kind of get in here at the tips and I'll just kind of pull on them, pull on a few strands, basically just to add some taper into the flashaboo so not everything's cut at the same length. I find that that helps the flashaboo uh, move around a lot more and, and prevents it from sticking together. You know, kind of once you do that, you can tie in this flashaboo more or less at the halfway point with the one half kind of facing backwards. Get your thumb and your forefinger in there and kind of spread those uh, flashaboo fibers around the fly as best you can. Once you've done that, then you're going to take the half that's facing forward fold it back over itself and just kind of do the same thing. Spread them around as best you can, lock those in with some thread wraps. And go ahead and just whip finish this. And cut that off. Again, before we move forward and attach the second shank, again, a little bit more super glue. Can't really have too much of this stuff. All right. Now our uh, our next shank is going to be the Flyman. Uh, let's see here. What size do we have? Can't ever remember the lengths of these things. This is the 20 millimeter articulated shank. So this is not one of the fish spines. This is uh, the smallest. Um, of the standard articulated shanks. It's a little bit shorter than our than our rear shank here. So go in and just kind of loop that into the eye there. You can pop that rear section out. Get that kind of secure into your vise. One thing that I find to be very helpful when I'm tying is these hair clips. I do a lot of work with articulated flies and, and flies that have multiple sections to them. These hair clips do a great job of holding stuff out of the way for you so it's not constantly kind of flopping down in front of you and getting in the way. Once you have that shank secured into the vise there, again, same thing. Start your, your thread just behind the eye. Lay a nice thread base all the way back down to the rear of the shank. Cut your tag. 
One thing when you're working with gel spun too that's really helpful is it's really hard to cut that gel spun thread if it's not under tension. So when you go to cut that tag, just make sure you have it pulled nice and tight when you go to trim it and, and you'll find that it's a lot easier to, uh, to cut the thread that way. And we're more or less gonna just repeat kind of what we did uh, in the rear section here. We're gonna do a polar chenille, wind it up about halfway, and then we're gonna add another, another hollow tie of yellow bucktail. Find my polar chenille, here we are. All right, go ahead and lay that polar chenille right in there. I like to tie this in kind of on the side of the shank with the, uh, with the longer fibers kind of facing downward for me that kind of gives me the best result when I'm wrapping this. It kind of just ensures that all these long fibers kind of lay uh, in a rearward direction when I'm, when I'm palmering this forward. You can get in there too with your fingers and just kind of help preen those, those fibers backwards as you're wrapping it. That way you're not trapping anything as you move forward. Got to be careful there where that loop comes in underneath on those shanks. It, a lot of times it has a really sharp edge and if you're not careful you can cut your materials or you can even cut your thread uh, sometimes. So always just kind of be mindful of that. So we'll wrap this about halfway up the hook shank. Go ahead and tie this off. Trim your excess and now we're move on to the bucktail. Little drop of super glue. All right, now for this piece of bucktail, you want to use just a little bit more than you, we used in the back section. That way we're building bulk and building mass as we progress forward into the fly. Um, I, as far as the amount, if you can use maybe, I don't know, about a third more than you used on that last section or the first section rather, uh, I usually progress about a third uh, in each tie, you know. Every time I tie in a piece, I'm using about a third more hair than I used on the previous piece, and that seems to be a pretty good pretty good ratio for that. Once you've preened out all your shorter fibers, come up here and I'll hold the uh, this bucktail right on top of the shank like that. And I want this hair to kind of extend about two thirds of the way back into this hollow tie here on that rear shank. Once you get that lined up, go ahead and cut your bucktail to length. Do one more check there. Make sure you get a nice clean cut too on that bucktail before you tie it in. Lay it up there in reverse, right on top of the shank. Give your bobbin a quick spin just to kind of constrict your thread there and we'll do three loose wraps. And again, just push with your thumb and your forefinger on the kind of the top and the bottom and then on the side That'll just kind of ensure that all that bucktail there is spread around nice and evenly. All right, looks good. Get in there with our fancy push tool. Pull your thread forward here and we'll start building up our thread dam. Using gel spun too can, it can be a little bit difficult to work with when you're trying to build a thread dam. Uh, the reason for that is, is this hair is, or this thread rather is, is super, super slick. So if you're not maintaining constant tension on your tying thread. When you're building your thread dam, it can collapse on you. So one little tip that I'll give you when you're tying this, this fly and anytime you're using gel spun for your hollow ties is as you're building that thread dam up in front of the hair, just always ensure that you have constant tension on the thread and that will prevent that thread dam from blowing out or collapsing on you, forcing you to kind of start over. Again, if you kind of look as we move forward, this station of bucktail a little bit steeper angle this rear one we were kind of sitting at about 45 degrees as we're moving forward this one's just a little bit taller all right that looks pretty good we'll go ahead and tie that off Oops. 
Sometimes I'll do a double whip finish too with this with this gel spun, just because it is so slick. Uh, sometimes if you just do one whip finish, it'll kind of back out on you. We're gonna end up coating this in super glue too, so it's not a not a big deal if you don't, but. looks pretty good. Now we're ready for our third and final section. We're going to move on to the hook. The hook that I'm using is the Gamagatsu SL12S. The size uh, is 4 aught. This is such a universal hook for me. I, I find myself using it for, for everything. The, the four and the six o sizes are great for, for pike flies, musky flies. Uh, they make them up to a 10 aught. I generally don't go that large. Eight aught's kind of about as large as I'll go, but it's just got a, a really, really strong hook. Uh, the wire's not overly uh, large in diameter, so it penetrates really well. You get good hookup with this hook. It also has a really, really deep um, bend to it. So once you get a fish stuck with this thing, you're generally, you're not gonna, not gonna lose it. Been using this hook for years and it's also incredibly durable too. All right, once you get that secured, start your thread base right behind the eye, bring it all the way back. To just kind of down into the bend there, which is kind of right in line with the barb on this particular hook. A lot of people, um, at this point, I'm going to do the articulation a little bit different than probably what you've seen uh, anywhere else and maybe in some other videos. Um, you'll most commonly see articulation wire used with some sort of beads as a spacer. Uh, I've found that with peacocks, uh, if there's any sort of, uh, of weakness in your fly at all, or, or they'll, they'll exploit any weakness in your fly, or, or they'll, they'll create a weakness. So what I like to do is I'll use a, an articulated shank to make my connection between the back section and the hook here. Um, it allows the fly, you'll see here, it allows the, uh, the rear sections to kind of swing around and move a lot. Um, the other thing that it does for me is it allows my articulation point to be stationary. So with wire, that wire tends to flex and move back and forth as that back section is swimming, which is kind of depleting uh, some of the energy or robbing some of the energy out of the fly. With a, a stationary articulation point like that, your fly can swim and move uh, a lot better than it would if your articulation point is mobile like it is with wire. This uh, is the 35 millimeter articulated shank. So what I like to do is we'll go ahead and thread that onto your, your back section there. And I'll just kind of lay it right up along the uh, the side of the hook here. And as I move forward, I'm just gonna wrap pretty tightly all the way up to the uh, the front of the hook there with open, uh, you know, spaced wraps. And then what I like to do before I go backwards is I'll lay some super glue on top of the shank so it can kind of bleed down into those wraps and get in there in between the, uh, the actual shank of the hook and the articulated shank there. So then we'll do really, really tight side-by-side -side wraps. Moving all the way back to the hook and then I'll come forward one more time and then all the way back. Kind of rub off any excess glue that may be on top there. All right. Again, I'll take a couple of these hair clips just to kind of hold everything up and out of the way here so we got room to work. This will start the same as every other section in this fly. I just kind of like to fill this void um, where my articulation point is with this polar chenille. Just kind of covers up that connection a little bit. The other thing it does is just allows me to incorporate more flash uh, into the fly. It also bleeds through the bucktail really nicely. 
Kind of gives the fly a little bit of inner flash and adds a little dimension to the fly. You're gonna wrap that up about a third of the way up the hook shank. Get in there, tie that off. Once that's locked in here, we are going to do one more cone of, uh, of yellow before we move on to the red. And again, just compared to the previous bundle, we're going to use about a third more hair than you did in the last section. Kind of preen out all your shorter fibers. Looks pretty good and again you want this to kind of extend about two-thirds of the way into that previous bunch there moving forward I don't know if you guys can pick that up on the camera there but that's about two-thirds or going about two-thirds of the way back uh, into this bucktail here once you get that kind of dialed in go in and make a good clean cut again and just like in the previous steps, right up on top, a couple of loose wraps, get in there and pinch top to bottom, pinch side to side. Push all those hairs back. Fancy your thread forward and start building up a thread dam. Again, just maintain constant tension on your thread while you're doing this. And what you're trying to do when you're building this thread dam is you're essentially just building a cone with your fly tying thread in front of this station of bucktail here. And with most hollow flies, as you can see the angle of the bucktail is just gradually kind of increasing from a flatter angle to a slightly steeper angle moving forward. That way you can kind of start building that really nice bait fish kind of pro profile. You know, if you look at most any bait fish, it's always going to be the tallest, uh, you know, right around the shoulders and the head of the fly. So we're just kind of keeping that in mind as we're progressing up the fly. All right. A little bit of glue. All right, now we're gonna move on to our head color, which is red. Kind of settled upon this color too, is, is always done really well, that red and yellow. After talking to a lot of fishermen, conventional fishermen that have fished down there for years and years and years, if you talk to them, uh, and, and if you ask them, there's one particular, uh, you know, lure and color that they could have. If there's one they had to fish for the rest of their life, a lot of them would say a red and yellow bucktail jig. Well, this is essentially just the uh, you know fly fisherman's version of that. And I would have to agree, this fly has done really, really well for me on all of these trips down there. My personal best peacock came on this particular pattern last January. All right. 
trim some red. Preen out your short fibers. Looks good. Right up on top. Three loose wraps. Again, same deal, just work those hairs 360 degrees around the hook shank. Make sure everything's kind of nice and even there. Pull this out of the way. Now, as you get towards the front of the fly, your thread dam or your thread cone doesn't need to be near as large because you're not trying to, to hold that bucktail. You're not trying to, you don't need that bucktail to lay back really, really flat. So your thread dam is going to be much shorter. And we're going to do one more tie-in of, uh, of bucktail here. And then we're going to move on to our, our head, which is going to be some 3D eyes and, and epoxy. Cutting it a little bit close on room here, but I think we'll manage. Just kind of push this piece and tie it in as close to that previous tie as you as you possibly can. Get up there, get that hair spread around 360 degrees. Make sure it's locked in. At this point, we're gonna, gonna not gonna go crazy on the thread dam here. You can see this is sticking almost up at 90 degrees. We don't need to uh, we don't need to get the angle of the bucktail really perfect just yet. What we're gonna those 3D eyes and the epoxy head is gonna kind of do that for us. Once you've done that, just kind of make sure everything's nice and secure, and we'll go ahead and tie this off. Now what I like to do here, this is not really necessary, but it's just something I think looks cool, is I'm just going to switch thread colors. I like to finish off with a, uh, with a yellow fly. I just think it adds a cool contrast to the fly and looks a little bit better than the white does. Again, this is just kind of a, a personal touch I like to add. It is by no means necessary or, or a crucial step to the fly. Just kind of looks cool once you build up those uh, those eyes with the epoxy. That yellow kind of bleeds through a little bit and, and kind of coordinates with the back part of the fly here. And it looks kind of cool. All right. Once you cover up that white thread head here with your yellow, just go ahead and whip finish, tie that off, cut that here. Now we're ready to add some eyes. These are the 10 millimeter eyes from Flyman. The, the living eyes, this color is wind. You can certainly use any color you like. The, uh, the important part to this is the size. Uh, 10 millimeter just seems to be the, the right fit for this particular pattern. Um, all right. What I'm gonna do is add just a little bit of glue onto our thread head here. And what I like to do is I like to just kind of glue these 3D eyes in place so they don't move around when I'm building up my, my resin or, or UV resin head on this fly. So I'll just put a little bit of zap up there and I'll lay these 
right on on either side of the uh, of the head. Just kind of give them a little pinch. Wait a few seconds for that glue to kind of set up for you. See if I can do this without gluing my fingers to the to the fly. That usually happens about half the time. All right, that eye's being a little bit stubborn, but we'll deal with it. All right, now that those eyes are in place, I'm going to use some of the Loon UV Fly Finish and Thick. And when you're building up these heads, the first thing I like to do is just kind of fill the void that's between the eyes on the top and the bottom. We'll start with this uh, with this top side first. Get my light ready, and and just kind of fill that gap in between the eyes. You don't need to worry too much about the shape of the the head at this point. We can we can do that after we after we get this basic step finished here. Hit it with the light. I'm using the new uh, Loon Infinity Light. This thing has really uh, spoiled me quite a bit from from what was what I had previous to this. The, the cure time with this light is just seconds. I mean, you can you can use it to build the biggest epoxy heads you want, and in five seconds or less, it's going to just cure it right away. The other nice thing about it is it comes with a rechargeable battery, which is nice. So you don't have to go out and buy a real expensive set of batteries every time the battery dies. You just plug it into the wall, you're good to go. The charge time is really, really nice on these two. These tend to last two or three days, you know, and I use my light quite a bit, so really, really nice light. Having a good light too, I feel like adds, uh, makes the fly a little bit more durable. If you can get a light that can cure your epoxy quicker, the, the strength of the epoxy uh, will, will be much greater. So now we're gonna get in here with the underside. Gonna do the same thing we did up top. We're just gonna kind of fill in that gap between the eyes. Now that that's done, those eyes are kind of locked in place there. Now what I like to do is I'll just kind of put a coat on either side of the fly, basically right on top of the eyes. And what that does is it just kind of seals everything in. It makes sure that uh, you know tooth or anything like that can't get in behind here on this eye and just pry it out. So uh, essentially I'm just kind of building a, uh, a mask essentially around the rest of this head here. So I'll kind of flip the fly right on its side and I just kind of like to go over the uh, the perimeter of the eye with my resin here. Then I'll go right over top of the eye. Hit it with the light. And go to the other side, do the exact same thing.
you get all that cured, I just kind of like to take the fly and kind of check all the sides just to make sure everything's set up real nice. And then the last stage in the fly is I'll just take and I'll coat this epoxy head with some uh, hard as hull or uh, this just kind of puts a nice shiny coat on it. That, that resin will leave kind of a tacky finish uh, after it sets up. The reason for that is, is it kind of, if you're to add another layer on top of that, it helps the two layers bond together. At this point, since we're finished with the fly, uh, taking some hard as hull and just kind of run it around the whole head here. And when that sets up, it'll give you that nice kind of clear, real glossy uh, coat to the fly. It also adds to the impact resistance uh, of the fly and will actually kind of help the fly last a little bit longer. This hardest haul is just bulletproof, it seems like. All right, looks pretty good. All right, guys, that is the Peacock Punisher. If you have any questions about this fly or, or any others, uh, feel free to, to email or call the shop uh, at any time. If you like this video, be sure to hit the subscribe button at the bottom. Thanks for watching.